All right, guys, so today looking at the vector diagram, uh, not the most exciting subject uh, of all of them, uh, but quite essential to understand it. If you can understand this, then actually the rest of the principles of flight will make a bit more sense when you're either uh, teaching it or trying to understand it yourself or prepping for a check ride or whatever. Um, if you can understand all, what all these various little lines um, and diagrams mean, then it will uh, also help you pretty much understand better uh, the dynamics of a helicopter. So vector diagram, references, uh, three, four, five, six is pretty useful. Pretty much any other book you can find uh, will give you roughly the same detail as well. Um, so the best way to start this really is just look right at the very, very basics of uh, flight, lift, and start with an aeroplane. Here's our aeroplane, noting in the middle you've got the aerofoil section or a cross section of it anyway. So in order to make uh, an aeroplane get off the runway, we have to produce lift. That lift basically counteracts weight. But in order to create lift, we need a couple of factors. We need a coefficient of lift that comes from the shape of the aerofoil, times that by half, times that by the density of the air, and then importantly, times that by the velocity of the air squared, and then lastly, by the surface area. So the velocity of the air is produced by a propeller or something like that, doesn't really matter what. but essentially by creating thrust. So if we manage to create thrust, we can drag the air, air, airplane down the runway, create an airflow over that airfoil, and then we get our lift, counteract the weight. But as always, there's a negative effect, and that, in the case of airplanes, pretty much any sort, is drag. I'm not gonna go into the different types of drag, we're essentially just gonna call it drag. So what we're going to look at today is how that relates to a helicopter and then how and why we use a vector diagram to explain it. So for the purposes of pretty much all the vector diagrams you guys are going to see, uh, we're going to pretend this is the center of the aircraft, this is the rotor blade, and if we look down from, a, from above and the rotor blade is um, going anti-clockwise around, we're going to look at a rotor blade looking from the mast, looking through the middle of the blade, so a cross section of the rotor blade as it passes down our right hand side of the aircraft um, on its way around anti-clockwise. So it doesn't matter how you're doing this, again it depends whether you're teaching it or explaining it, but um, you, can you can prepare the actual basis like this, or you can just do it as you go. Two axes, Y, X, and then usually to keep it as steep as you can, it become clear, an aerofoil, noting that the trailing edge goes down to the origin. Okay, so that's the basis of it. So the first thing to explain here is that we are, rather than attaching an aerofoil to a wing, we're attaching it to um, a, a mast and we're attaching multiple blades. And in order to create that airflow, we're spinning it around in a horizontal plane. Okay, so it's going around in the same horizontal plane the whole time. Okay, and we call that the plane of rotation. Plane of rotation. All the rotor blades, whether you've got two, four, five, eight, whatever, they're all gonna be attached to the mast, okay, and they're gonna spin around the mast and we call that the axis of rotation. So that gives the two, um, two axes. The next, by moving it around in this planar rotation, we're basically essentially forcing this rotor blade 
forwards like that. By forcing it forwards, we're effectively creating an airflow that's coming back over the top or coming and impacting um, the aerofoil in, in that uh, direction. And we essentially just call that the rotational airflow. That doesn't really matter where you put that, if I'm perfectly honest. Um, together with any other aerofoil you have, you have the standard things. Always put your cord line on, which is going to attach the leading edge to the trailing edge. Okay, and also you can add in um, as best you can anyway your pitch angle. Like I so. Okay, so that's the basics and the basis of the diagram. Like I said, you can produce that before you start all this, and it just makes life a little bit easier. Uh, but it's dependent on how the how the, uh, on the on the context. So this is the most important thing to try and understand when it comes to helicopters. Uh, this next little bit. So if we've got an aeroplane moving through the air, okay, we've got this cross-sectional aerofoil. Okay. Um, obviously, I've put quite an, a, um, a uh, harsh angle on that one, uh, pitch angle. So if we imagine a load of static air here, and then suddenly out of nowhere, this aerofoil comes along and moves through that static air, essentially what's going to happen is a little bit of the air is going to hit the bottom and get deflected downwards. And some of it's going to go over the top and actually follow the, the um, aerofoil and deflect downwards as well. But that aeroplane is going to move from right to left, disappear out of the way, and this air at the top here is going to be relatively undisturbed after that. There'll be a little bit of air movement down, but that will, the momentum will run out and uh, eventually come to a stop. Let's imagine now we've got a helicopter in the hover though. This blade's just gone past, um, so there's a little bit of movement downwards, but then a millisecond later, we get another blade come past. So this air that's already started to be moved down gets a little bit of extra momentum, but also we have another little bit of airflow that comes over and gets impacted by that blade. So suddenly we've got a little bit more air moving down. Add another blade into the mix, another millisecond later. You can see it building now, we've got even more air moving down. So as you can see, with a helicopter, notably in the hover, because we have a rotor blade that moves past the same point every um, millisecond or so, we essentially are creating a continuous flow of airflow coming down. This static column that's sitting above um, the airflow originally has had a little bit of air drawn down through by each one, so eventually we're getting a more continuous flow of air being dragged down from the column of air above it. Uh, we're also, to a certain extent as well, creating a little bit of a vacuum. As this air is being pulled down here, we're creating an area of low pressure, which again this column of air starts to, 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 um, to fall into or get dragged into. So this static column of air essentially starts to get pulled down or induced down through the disc. Um, I said it was predominantly in the hover. As you move forward, you're still going to induce air down through the disc, but we won't get into that now. Um, but it's going to be slightly reduced as the um, aerofoil moves forward away from that column of air. But the essential thing to um, understand here is that it's called induced flow, and it's because air has slowly been pushed down through the disc from above by successive blades moving past the same point. Right, so how does that look? on the actual diagram. Well, we already have talked about the fact we've got a rotational airflow that's been um, being set up by this plane of rotation and the blades moving around. So what happens now is we've created that airflow like we've just shown, but we've also started to create this deflection downwards, which gives us a vertical flow of air. So we can now add that onto our diagram. And we'll do it crudely to start with by just sticking an arbitrary vertical flow of air, which we'll call the induced flow. <coughs> 
And what the effect that has is you've now got a horizontal movement of air and also a vertical movement of air. And if you think right back to school or ground school, uh, you might just remember that you have um, uh, vectors and you can now resolve these vectors. Uh, and the way we do that is we literally just join them up. Because this movement horizontally is going to drag that that way. So now we've got an actual relative airflow. So that's the, the, the direction that the um, airfoil is actually going to feel that airflow hitting it at or impacting it at. What we'll look at now then is adding the angle of attack in. So between the cord line and the relative airflow, we then have our angle of attack. And we can label that one as well. And we'll also need to label the relative airflow. When you do this on a board, it's not quite as cramped. So we've got an angle of attack. Um, so we now are ready to add in our lift. So exactly perpendicular, whether you've got an aeroplane or a helicopter or a single roast blade or, or multiple, the uh, lift always acts exactly perpendicular to the relative airflow. <clears throat> and for this purposes on the diagram, um, you'll have a much bigger diagram if you're using a board. So essentially it's just an arbitrary length line and that one we'll call lift. Penalty, again, same in an airplane and a helicopter. You're gonna get drag. Okay, and then we're back to this uh, resolution of vectors again. So we've got uh, two vectors, but they're neither horizontal or vertical. So what we're gonna do is join them up so we get what is called a total reaction. And that will essentially combine these two vectors into one simple uh, vector which we can now resolve horizontally and vertically. And as you can imagine, by having a horizontal and a vertical component, we can now directly transpose this onto our aeroplane. So we have, first of all, a the most important one of all, so the, the vertical thing, uh, the vertical vector, which is holding this uh, rotor blade or pulling this, this rotor blade upwards. And I've added in total rotor thrust there. So that's the total rotor thrust, which essentially, um, once you've combined all the different rotor blades, uh, together, the total rotor thrust is acting upwards uh, against the weight, and as long as it's equal and opposite or more than the weight, then the aircraft will go up or essentially just not come down. So that's the total rotor thrust. So the next one is the horizontal component then. Uh, so I've already put on here then uh, rotor drag, so eventually um, as this blade is trying to move in this direction, we've got a force clearly based on this vector diagram that's acting against it. And that's all the different types of drag. Again, I'm not going to go into that one, but it's what we've resolved as the drag. Uh, in order to keep that blade moving forwards, in order to make that blade go forwards and generate that airflow, we use engines of whatever type in helicopters, loaded gears to turn the, uh, the mast and the rotor blades and push it forwards. That inevitably creates a torque, which is why we now have the horizontal component going in the direction of travel, which is our torque. And that pretty much concludes all the different uh, elements that you need to add onto your uh, vector diagram. That's all you need to put on. Um, clearly, if you've got a bigger board, it'll be a little bit easier to see, a little bit more easy to understand, um, and you can actually annotate it a little bit more neatly. Uh, but that should be all you need. The last little thing that I've added on the bottom here, though, 
uh, is the scale and the cross-section position. This is predominantly really for a your own understanding, but also for anybody who's trying to teach this. Um, first of all, uh, clearly most uh, helicopter rotor blades go around uh, you know 200 plus knots, which means that this rotational airflow section here would probably be a have a lot bigger if we drew this to scale, um, and it's going to be a lot bigger in comparison or relative to the uh, induced flow or the velocity of that induced flow coming through the disc. You're never really going to get an induced flow coming through the disc at, at you know 100 mile an hour or something like that, um, but. To make the uh, diagram a little bit easier to draw clearly, rather than having a, a, a four foot long piece of paper, we make it a little bit shorter, we make the induced flow a little bit fatter, and therefore that gives us a slightly shorter uh, relative airflow and easier to draw. So scale is the first part, and then the second part really um, is the cross-sectional position. So as you can see, we've got the trailing edge, which is attached to the uh, point of origin there. In reality, the lift uh, total rotor thrust is going to act from the, the center of pressure, which in most cases is towards the sort of front third of the aerofoil. Uh, but again, for illustration purposes, uh, we pull the aerofoil forwards, so it's just the trailing edge at the, tri at the origin, and that enables us to draw these vectors around it from a single point without having to draw all over a um, an aerofoil picture. You can probably see where it would end up being. Uh, and it also makes it a little bit more clear uh, from the point of view of cord lines, angle of attacks, etc. So they're the two sort of points to take away from any, anybody who's particularly interested uh, when you are trying to explain this to them. Uh, I hope that's useful. Again, as always, um, put a comment below if there's anything you've seen that's wrong, anything you'd like seeing uh, done better, or if you've got any other comments really. Uh, not afraid to take any, any um, uh, advice and criticism. Uh, thank you very much.